expand it, expand it. Very good. Good morning. Uh, thanks for your interest in uh, attending this morning's uh, native grass identification Q and A. Um, I guess this has come about from the response to inquiries we had prior to COVID, um, and we were getting probably three to five plants a day dropped off to um, various offices or sent in through emails. So there was obviously quite a lot of interest. So we thought we'd uh, just run this session this morning. Um, the prolific flush of pasture has led to uh, enormous pasture growth, as, uh, as many of you would know, across the, um, the northwest region. And this followed the, the dry period and then the really good late summer and autumn rainfall that we had, combined with the soil temperatures, led to this uh, amazing flush of, uh, of native grasses. Um, now, the, the native species um, based pastures, um, particularly the native grasses, as well as, um, you know, we've, seen, we've been getting the natives as well as some less desirable species. So, um, so um, less desirable species, including the you know, cat heads and burrs. So while many of you are experience of, experiencing a flush of weeds, which may be unwanted, it is likely that the native perennials and annuals will come back up through them um, and successfully seed. So with reasonable grazing management, the grass component can rebuild and reduce the future weed levels. Um, weeds will predominantly will colonise the bare areas. So by building up your ground cover levels, you can help to reduce the, the weed burden in future years. So, uh, so I'm George Truman with the uh, local land services in the in the mixed farming role. So I'll just so the overview for our um, session today is we're going to run a, a small video. Um, then we're going to follow that with some identification. So things to look for in the paddock or when you're out driving around the farm in the ute. Um, if you're keen to, to collect a sample and then send it in, just some tips on, on how to preserve the sample and, and what to send in so that it's, uh, it arrives to uh, us in, in good condition and we can actually um, make some uh, you know, help with some interpretation or identification of that species. Um, what to take a photo of, where you can send your sample for identification, some available resources, because there's uh, some great um, look up books, there's some online resources, um, and there's some good field guides that are available that uh, you could may use to with your ID. I was just gonna run through some common species that we're seeing at the moment, and uh, touch on um, nutrition because uh, a lot of these native grasses form large parts of our farming system, farming and grazing systems. And I know we've been getting a lot of inquiries about um, the nutritional value of the native grasses. And, uh, and then this will be followed with some questions. Um, I thought just be, before we got into the video, um, I'd just start touch on native introduced annual and perennial, because they're uh, terms we hear a lot. And also when you look at your, some of your IDs, um, they're words that pop up. So, so native grasses basically refer to those that are naturally occurring in the region. We've got introduced, which are origina originating from another country. So a lot of our um, pastures that have become naturalized are actually introduced. Um, perennial, so these are plants that grow for more than two years and they, repro they reproduce from the, the new tillers each year from a persistent crown. So an example of this might be a red grass. And then we've got annuals. So these are plants that complete their life cycle in, in the one year um, and then reproduce each year from a seed. Um, an example here might be barley grass. And then we've got warm season and cool season or year long plants. So warm season predominantly growing in the warmer months of the year for example, love grass and a cool season, maybe something like wheat grass. So they're just a, uh, a couple of terms which are useful to know about. Radio. So I'm just going to run this uh, video. Okay, all right.
information and uh, information, and also the Royal Botanic Gardens. They actually have an ID, a plant ID service. So I guess if you're out there and you actually see some grass in the office, I'm George Trotter from the Services. I'm in native grass identification. A lot of you have been interested to see what's going to come back, particularly after the subsequent five period. And I thought, Chris, which is great to say, so are interested this are on your farm. Because the native grasses are in terms of identity books out there. Have collected them at various field days. Uh, the common species that we're seeing at the moment. An on um, document, which is yeah. uh, grasses of the Central West, which provides some really good um, online work. Actually, has an So, I guess if you're out there, you actually see some grass here with. The most important thing is to try and collect a fresh sample. So a bit of old newspaper in the year. If you put each between the different greens and it would so and also and safe. So the one thing is to try and put into the white paper. On its own, even if you've got to spread it out a little bit, the stem leaves on a separate piece of paper and a separate paper, the plants or just the top of the um, as a photo. It could provide us with three photos, plus a little bit of basic information. So where did you find it? Was it a book or the contour bay? Was it a sheet or a gallery? Just a little bit of a location as well as the source. Pictures or how to identify is because sometimes a lot of different species um, so have different um, characteristics that they prefer. And if you can send those in, we'll have a look and uh, see what we might have. Grasses are a really good way to look at germs. So As to the value of this, so as to whether there's any um, issues to do with toxicity that you need to be aware of. Happy to fire that up, and any other things that you might be interested in at this time of the year, just to uh, come to Very good. Okay, I hope you uh, just enjoyed that little video. We ran that uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was uh, out in the paddock, and um, so uh, then we thought we'd uh, we'd incorporate it into our uh, our session this morning. So I guess um, just leading on from uh, some of the points in the uh, the video, basically identification of of grasses is all about you know what do they look like, and so um, there's a lot that you can gain just from looking at them in the paddock yourself, and also taking taking some notes. So so what does it look like? You know, is the plant tall? Is it small? Is it, uh, is it prost prostrate, as in spreading along the surface? Um, with identification, the flower or seed head is probably the main feature that, uh, that we can actually use to, uh, to identify them. So, which is why now and uh, late summer is, uh, is a perfect time to be, uh, be out and having a look at your pastures because they generally are in, uh, in, in a seed or a flower or a seed head and uh, you've got access to that information. So, so I've just got a few diagrams there about the seed heads because there's three really distinct uh, features. They're either clustered, so uh, where the seeds are very sort of tightly held on the, um, on the branch, 
Then we've got um, seed heads that are open. So there's really open, particularly with some of the panics and that, we've got a really open seed head. Um, and the third one is where they're like finger-like. So the, the seeds are out on, on small branches off from the, um, the main stem. And uh, most of the, um, the books and, and identification um, list will, uh, keys will basically start with your, your seed head because that's a, a really uh, distinguishing feature of the, um, the grasses. And then the other thing uh, is where is it growing? So native grasses are a really good indication of our landscape. There's, um, you know, they, they really either like, um, you know, wet areas, they like like rocky areas or dry areas. So, so where is it growing? Is it in a, um, an old, um, you know, sometimes we get them in there around the cattle yards, it might be under a tree, um, just looking at the, the position in the, in the landscape. Um, also the soil type. So is it a, a light soil? Is it heavier soil? Clay, sand, so, sandy soil. So, so grasses have you know, preference to these sorts of um, soil types. And uh, if you do know where it is growing, um, or you can record that, then it, it does help a lot in, uh, in identification. And generally grasses won't grow alone. There'll be a, a mix of species. We often talk about a, a native grassland community. So there's um, grasses that will grow um, with others. And so if you do know some of the other species, it's worth making a, a note of that so that you, um, we can see what sort of a community um, is growing there. So uh, I guess just some, some pictures of what we were talking about in the, in the video is preserving your sample. So it's really handy to go to some newspaper, take with you and, and collect the samples and, and lay them in between the pages. It just helps to um, preserve them. It stops them getting broken and crushed. And uh, it's, it's a great way, you know, if you haven't got time to, to deal with it straight away, you can collect a number of um, samples pop them in the paper and then uh, and deal them when you've got um, got time to. Now this is the, the really key thing and uh, I guess with the native grass ID, whether you're, you're doing it yourself or whether you're um, sending it uh, off to one of the online um, identification services or whether you can send it into LLS, this is, uh, this is what we really need to see, particularly at the moment where we can't um, you can't access the officers direct, um, then an email with some photos is uh, is a great option. But um, we do encourage you to try and take some some good photos. So all I've done here is is take a close up photo of the seed head, just on a on a, a white you know it could be the kitchen bench or a piece of paper, um, some of the leaf and the stem because uh, it's got some um, distinguishing features as to how the leaf might come out from the stem. And also the base of the plant or, or the root. We don't need to dig them up, but um, just having a look at that that base um, is important because uh, colour is another thing. There's a lot of grasses have got, you know, they might have a purpley um, base. Um, these become these are distinguishing features that um, that help with identification. So a couple of quick photos like that, and then attached to an email um, goes a long way to uh, to helping with um, identification of these grasses. So across the Northwest, we've got um, many LLS staff with a, a great knowledge um, identif and identification skills of, um, of grasses. So um, what we do is encourage you, if you want to do some ID, is to send um, something in to myself. I've got the email address there, and then uh, I can distribute it or disseminate it to um, staff that I know in particular um, parts of the region that may have a better uh, knowledge of those grasses in that particular um, landscape, um, or we can uh, we certainly can do some um, some identification. So that yeah, the presence of of species can tell you a lot about your country. As I said, the the preference to high, to heavy or, or light soils um, is uh, is really a good way of um, of to of identifying you know, parts of your your property. So some of the resources for plant ID, the Royal Botanic Gardens have a, uh, an ID service um, and these websites will be available at the um, conclusion of the, uh, the session this morning. There's another site called PlantNet um, and these are, are quite useful. You can you send in the photos as we've discussed and um, 
they can uh, provide some identification. The, uh, the Stiper Association have a, uh, a quite a good online guide, and there's a myriad of um, resources and field guides um, and local publications that, um, that I know many people have got. They've collected them at, uh, at various field, field days. Um, or they are they are available at um, some of the uh, the LLS and uh, and DPI offices. So I've just uh, popped a few guides here that uh, you might be familiar with um, that are really great for our our northwest region. So the the one on the left, the blue bluey one, um, look it talks about it being suitable for the lower Namoi floodplain, but it's very good for across the the northwest region and. Uh, this is uh, still available. Um, it's one that you might have picked up at field, field days. It really is a, a good little um, ID booklet in that it has some um, a good description, but it also has good photos that are that have been taken locally. So uh, it really does represent the, what the plants do look like in um, in the paddock themselves. There's the uh, the rangelands glove box guide. Many people in the western part of the region have, have got these, which are really great. Um, I did just put the one about uh, the trees and tall shrubs. It's, an, it's, not, it's quite a good little one too, because um, these grasses also grow in com communities, as I talked about. So also being aware of some of the trees is, uh, goes a long way to understanding your, your grassland identification as well. And the, uh, the pasture plants of the slopes, um, it's, an, it's an older book, but it's very, uh, very good and, and very available. And as I said, um, a lot of uh, groups or, or um, people may have these. I know a lot of land care groups um, would have them. So yeah, we have got some available or um, we can um, we can potentially lend them out or make them available at various local land services offices once um, we're able to be uh, reopened. So I just listed a, a, some of the, the commonly seen species. Um, I certainly wasn't able today in my interest of time of going through all the, uh, the different ones, but um, uh, these are just some of the, the ones that we're particularly seeing at the moment. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd mention them. The plains grass, um, many would be quite familiar with these, um, this grass, particularly on the, at the heavier soil country um, across the Liverpool plains. It's a, um, a year round um, grass. So it's, it's actively growing throughout the, um, the summer and the winter. Um, the blown grass, starting to see a little bit of it, particularly these grasses now they're in, uh, they've, they've gone into, uh, they've reproduced, they've produced a seed head. They're uh, in that senescence stage where they start to hang off. Um, they're certainly um, quite um, noticeable around um, some areas. The hairy panic, um, native millet, fairy grass, wallaby grass, spear grass, quite a lot of people would be particularly um, aware of that. A little few issues with, um, with sheep and with eyes um, in that uh, it's, the seed head is quite, um, quite spiky and does impact sometimes on sheep with wool and um, with eyes of uh, livestock. Slender bamboo grass, plume grass, cooch grass, Queensland bluegrass, so not to be confused with the red grass, um, very similar structure. Um, the bluegrass is always exciting to see it because it is um, it is certainly one of the the more desirable. Um, it's the one with the little white um, the white uh, little skirt around the node. Um, it's quite a, a distinct one and always nice to uh, to see it in a um, in a grassland paddock. Red grass, which is fairly common. Your windmill and umbrella grass, um, or I heard it referred to as fence grass the other day, um, in that it's what we're seeing uh, all blown up against the, the fences and uh, paddocks at the moment with that recent wind. Um, the katora grass, wire grass, cup grass, shot grass, summer grass, um, and then in the western part of the, the landscape, more the, the Mitchell grasses. Um, there's a variety of species there, um, kangaroo grass and, uh, and never fail. So they're our, our native grasses, and then we've got a lot of um, introduced grasses, which we sort of become quite naturalised in our in our landscape, um, and uh, and certainly have a have a role in our um, in our livestock and grazing systems as well, um, but but are uh, are introduced, and these are things like distinct grass, many the love grasses, and there's a variety of species there, 
your roads grass, liver seed grass, barnyard grass, pass palum, cooler tie, buffalo barley, etc. So yeah, they're just some of the um the introduced grasses that we do um commonly see. Now just um I just put this slide up um just to to touch on nutritional value because um a lot of um, people ask us about um, you know, the, uh, the value of these grasses in a, uh, a livestock system. Um, so they, they vary, vary significantly. It, it really will depend on your soil type, the fertility, the rainfall, and your grazing management. It's, it's not consistent. Um, it really can vary depending on where it is growing and how it is managed. Um, all grasses have a, a nutritional value in terms of um, when they're being grazed, so I guess the, the stage of the growth. I guess as a, as a rule of thumb, um, the crude protein and your digestibility of your native grasses will differ in the different parts of the plant. So obviously the nutritional value of green material is going to be greater than a dry, dry material and leaf is going to be more digestible and more palatable um, than a stem. So it really depends on what stage the plant is growing. So when they're, they're young and they're green and growing, they certainly do pr produce um, a higher nutritional value. As you go through to flowering, um, energy is put into reproduction and then they start to hay off to a dried stalk they're generally going to decrease in your traditional value. And that's um, the same as with our some of our introduced tropical grasses and temperate grasses. Anything's going to reduce in nutritional value as it gets older. But um, when they're young and green and growing, then they certainly do provide um, a value. And that is important because uh, I think we, we, we tend to disregard some of our native grasses a little bit in terms of um, the production. We undervalue them, but they do form a very important part of our mixed farming systems. And I guess, yeah, when they are managed and um, they do then provide um, a source of production um, in, uh, in our livestock systems. Okay. Um, just wanted to also um, note a little bit about um, the fertility. So like native grasses are important for feed, um, as well as the, the introduced and our, our tropical and temperate grasses. Um, many native grasses grow in soils where they are in their natural state. So they tend to have, um, we do tend to see some common deficiencies in some of the native grass systems in, in phosphorus and sulfur. Um, so for native grasses to provide good protein, they need nitrogen, as with a lot of um, uh, pasture systems. So having a good legume base um, is good in the native grass systems to supply that, that nitrogen. Um, there are many native legumes, which are parts of it, form parts of our grassland, which produce that, um, provide that nitrogen. However, in some areas where legumes are, are deficient, then you know, there may be the, the need to consider some, some fertilizer to, to provide that nitrogen that the, um, the native systems do need to, um, to grow and, and produce, particularly where they are part of a, a livestock grazing um, system. So um, it is important, like anything, that, um, that they have that, um, that fertilizer or that fertility to um, to respond and be um, actively growing in that in that landscape. Um, so just to, in uh, winding up, there's some uh, there are some training opportunities. The the TOCAL um, often have identification courses, and I know um, we try and keep people up to date of any training that's um, available. Local land services. We were just about to hold a, a native veg um, a native grass identification session up at Moree just prior to the um, COVID. So um, I'm hoping that we can um, we can keep that scheduled for the future. And I know there's um, quite a few groups, the Grassland Society, um, some land care groups um, and other groups that do from time to time offer native grass identification days. And, and these are a really great opportunity to get along. 
um, often we, they encourage you to bring grasses from your own place and um, you get the chance to, uh, to go through and actually identify what you've, um, what you've got growing. So um, that's really it for, for today, but um, look, it's, it's great that you're, that you're interested in the native grasses. Um, they are, um, as I said, an important part of our landscape. We've been really lucky this year with the season to, um, to get such a, a germination and uh, prolific growth, and um, which is great to see. It just shows the resilience of, of the native seeds because we've had really poor years where we've had, I guess, a lot of, um, we have had some of the grasses, but sometimes they're the ones that are a bit more dominant. dominant. Sometimes um, they're not, not as desirable, and, um, but they are obviously very hardy. But this season has um, has really allowed us has, has allowed some of the the grasses to to regenerate uh, um, to germinate that haven't been in our in our systems for a while and it's it's really good to to see some some really desirable grasses um, growing. I guess the big challenge is to to try and let that uh, that seed set go through um, so that you're um, you're allowing that sort of continuity continuity of that seed to um, to provide good um, good cover in the in your grasslands and uh, and native paddocks. Um, okay, so um, with that, um, we're keen to uh, follow up on some of the questions that have been uh, coming through during this morning session. Okay. Online guides. Can we stop? Sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so we're just um, checking on uh, some of the questions. Um, one of the questions come through about. Um, the online online guides. So um, just jumping back here to the the resources for plant ID. So yeah, some of these uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens. Um, as I said, the the plant net. And look, if you um, if you search, if you in your um, search engines, if you type native veg or native grass identification, um, there's some really good um, good resources there um, on uh, online. The um, the other question was about um, scientific names. So most of these uh, little guidebooks, and I've got the one in front of me, the, the blue one, which is the, the common plants of the grazing, um, grazing systems, um, provides you with those, those, those scientific names. So I, I'm happy to go back to that list I had. And um, if some of those, so the plains grass um, is the, um, and I'm not too sh so keen about trying to pronounce some of the um, the scientific names, but it's the uh, Ostrostriper. Um, for those that are, are familiar with that, the um, yeah, there's quite a lot of information there on the uh, scientific names for those grasses. Um, I guess the uh, the some of the identification that we've been doing um, and some of the the questions that have been coming through in terms of management is any um, issues with toxicity so uh, particularly with with livestock um, so generally we, we refer any um, inquiries about that through to our um, livestock officers in terms of the the particular grass plants but look some of them um, some of the the issues that are particularly um, is, is an issue are the spikelets. So, um, particularly with the spear grass, as I mentioned, and the um, uh, wire grass too, is the awns, the spikes, the flowers have sort of got a, an awn, um, and they can get embedded in in the skin, particularly within wool, and they can impact on on eyes and things as well. So, um, it's more to do with the seed head. Though some some grasses can have some some toxicity um, at particularly um, at particularly young stage of growth, um, there's sometimes issues with nitrate in 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 younger growing um, plants. But um, any of those management, it's best to um, we're best to yeah we refer the uh, inquiry then to 
to one of the vets as to whether they have seen or aware of any um, issues with toxicity or um, or any enemy animal any animal health issues with those grasses at particular stages of growth. Um, so I guess uh, there's just another question there that's that's come in a little bit about the the grazing management because um, um, although many of the the native grasses in are in some of our um, natural areas, a lot of the our native grasses form important parts of our our farming system. So I guess the the perennial species they're able to persist over over long dry periods um, and they regrow and replenish and the seed when the seed, uh, when moisture arrives. The long-term persistence um, of annuals is due to their ability to regenerate from seed. So, so those annual seeds can lie dormant for, for several years. Um, I guess the biggest risk um, and loss of our native grasses has been through overgrazing um, and constant grazing has led to species loss um, and invasion by weeds. So, in a lot of cases, we're tending to see less of our desirable species. Um, some of the sweeter grasses, more palatable, they tend to become grazed out. And uh, in a lot of cases, then we're, we're left with the grasses that, that stock aren't so keen on. And that can be some of your, your red grasses and, and wire grass and, and others. So it is, um, it is really important like a year in a year like this to to probably allow that seed set and, and not be tempted to to graze um, too soon because um, it is a great opportunity for some of those species that that may have been uh, dormant for some time to um, germinate um, go into reproduction and then set seed and that's helping to allow that um, that generation of, of new growth new new seeds coming in in future years so good grazing management is is really needed for for long term persistence of of native grasses. Um, there is good evidence um, that suggests that that good grazing can also lead to a diversity of plants, um, and also provides a variety of feed over over different seasons. Um, the native grasses are also a great habitat for beneficial insects um, and fauna, um, and also genetic diversity. Um, to reduce impacts by pests and, and diseases, so uh, they do have a, a very important role in our um, in our landscapes. So, from a from a grazing perspective, it's um, ideal a rotational grazing system, so that um, plants can be grazed but not overgrazed. Um, so, avoiding a set stocked or being gray or avoid grazing to the ground is only going to um, to lead to invasion of weeds. And that's what uh, you're probably seeing a lot of too, is a prolific um, growth of, of weeds as well. Weeds will basically colonize areas where there's um, bare ground. Um, so this you know, competition for, for moisture and for light, um, the thicker and more um, native grass you have, then the less weeds you're likely to have. Generally, um, a good, well-managed native grass will, um, will outcompete the weeds and, and shade them out and uh, and reduce the competition. So um, then you you avoid getting uh, avoid too many um, native too many weeds um, taking over an area. Uh, so another question in about harvesting native grass. Um, there are a couple of um, options around. Some um, contractors um, as well that. Um, are available to do it. I guess it's um, it is it is hard. It is a very it's a very small seed. Um, it is um, actually uh, managing it and getting it to um, the actual sowing. I know people have talked about um, sowing native grasses. Um, one, the seed is very expensive, but it's also just dealing with it. It's um, being such a small seed. It is actually getting it. Um, actually being able to plant it. I um, I sort of try and encourage people to, um, particularly in some of the degraded native pastures they have, they talk about wanting to, um, you know, to, to re-establish grasses. It's really about letting, letting nature, nature take its course. In, in a lot of cases, um, 
just naturally letting um, the grasses come back. Sometimes it may be you know less desirables first. It might be weeds, but there's been some really good um, regeneration and recovery of of native grass um, paddocks just through rest um, and um, grazing, like so rotational or light grazing, just to to um, to manage the uh, the weed burden or anything that comes up. But it's it's probably better to try and deal with what native natural um, seed is there um, than trying to to reestablish because uh, these seeds can last quite a few years in the in the soil and um, it just takes a season where the the rains at the right time um, the soil temperature that we've had um, can be the trigger to to the regeneration of some of these grasses. It may not happen every year, but it um, it certainly has. Um, ha has occurred in this season. But uh, yeah, just there are a few options for the, the harvesting, um, but um, it's probably not the, um, yeah, it's it's not the easiest thing to, to deal with um, once you've actually got the seed is, is the drying down and then um, and trying to, you know, to sow it. But I mean, you're going to get a lot of natural, you'll get natural movement of seed through livestock movement um, anyway. And wind, I mean, these seeds are very small um, in a lot of the natives, just the, the wind um, will, uh, will carry them and um, into other areas. So um, yeah, look, it's great to see the, the questions coming through. And um, as I said, today was just a, a bit of a trigger from um, the fact that we were getting, I was getting three or four people at the counter um, there for a couple of weeks there with with grasses and uh, and uh, as I said it was great to great to see people interested in that and um, we just thought we'd we'd share a few thoughts and a, a few resources um, that you you know and also the opportunity to email things in because um, given the fact that we're um, working in isolation and and that at the moment um, we still wanted you to um, to have that opportunity to um, to follow up with some some ID or some um, further information about our native um, grasses that are in our northwest region. All right, okay, thanks um, Thanks for today and uh, thanks for participating. And um, yeah, certainly uh, certainly happy for you to, um, to follow up if you'd like to know any more information. All right, thank you.